Sure. So what we're basically doing, it's an accounting. And then we're going to make a jump to percent in a source. It's sort of percent slash likelihood. And that's kind of how you can think of this. Um, now, likelihood, in, we're going to talk about some things about how you sort of, well, two value judgments you can make with probability. But we typically say the probability of an event, this is the way the text approaches it. It's a measure of how likely the event will occur. So it's a measure of how likely the event will occur. And we're going to contrast this where we look at, say, what are these sort of odds of an event not occurring or something that we don't want to see happen occur. And that's when we get into odds or um, sort of odds in favor and odds against kind of thing. So first off, what probability is, I'm going to give you what's called sort of a real simple sort of starting point for it. Maybe a little too simplified, but in a sense, it's going to be this. It's the number. Okay, let me back up because they were a little particular, so I wanted to terrible. So let me describe a little bit more. So first off, I mentioned it's a measure, and what you're doing is you're assigning a number to an event. And it's a number between from zero to one. Now, zero, if you have a probability of zero, that means it's impossible for the event to occur. And a probability of one means that it's certain to occur. And most of the probabilities we're going to be dealing with are going to fall somewhere in between. So let me give you an example. Well, first off, before, let me do a little bit. Let's talk about something else first. Now we've seen this a little bit. We have something called a sample space. Where did they get their definition? This is every possible outcome of some experiment. So we're kind of going back to what we talked last time, where we're looking at how to count things, and we have some kind of an experiment, and something will happen. And so we call the sample space everything that this experiment could possibly throw out. Uh, for example, let's say we have toss a coin. 
Now, this is the experiment for tossing a coin. So what would be the sample space? Well, from this experiment, what are all the possible outcomes? Well, when you toss a coin, you usually just get two, unless by some miracle the coin somehow stands on its side and just sort of stare upright. But usually you're going to get two results. You'll get either a heads or a tails. Now, if we make the experiment a little more complicated, Let's say we do this. Twice. So we toss a coin twice. Now, what is the sample space? Well, in this case, it's going to be a little more complicated. We want to ask, what are all the possible outcomes of this experiment? Well, the experiment is, what's going to happen to our cosmos if we flip this coin twice? What do we get? Well, maybe we're not looking at the cosmos, but this particular little piece of it. Well, the experiment could turn out to have an outcome of heads and an outcome of heads. So the results of the experiment, heads shows up twice. Or you could get tails and tails. We could get tails twice. Or we could have gotten heads then tails. Or we could have gotten tails then heads. <clears throat> so depending on the kind of experiment we're doing, we're going to get a different sample space. So that's the idea. This is sort of all the possible outcomes that some kind of experiment can produce. Now I got to talk about the event. Let's see. Now, an event is a subset of a sample space. Now, usually what an event is, it's something that we're focusing on. Um, or maybe we're focusing on it because we want to see something happen, or we're focusing on it because this is what we want to try to avoid. But that's the idea of an event. And what we tend to do with probability is, of all the possibilities that are before us, is there a likelihood for a certain smaller set of possibilities to occur? Uh, for example, let's say you were going to um, go down to the animal shelter. You're going to uh, adopt a cat. And you're going to choose randomly. You're not going to ask about any, any sort of particular properties of the cat. Just choose a random cage number. Well, what's the likelihood or probability that the cat you take home is a um, calico cat? Well, that would be an event. There's a whole sample space of cats waiting to be adopted. And probably not all of them are calico. Only a subset are. So the event we're going to be interested in is, OK, of the huge sample space of all of these cats, what's the event or the likelihood if you choose randomly, without looking, that you get a calico cat? So that's the idea of an event. So let me give you an example. Let's go back to tossing. Our coin twice. So 
what's the event of getting one or more heads? Now, let me bring back that sample space. So we're tossing a coin twice again. Um, we want to know the event of getting one or more heads. So that means we take a look at these outcomes and we pull from these outcomes every outcome that has at least one or more heads. And it's going to be this. So this is going to be our event. It's all the outcomes that contain one head or more. So then you might ask this question. The event of no heads. Well, in this case, there's only one outcome where you don't get any heads, and this is going to be it. So again, an event is just a subset of the entire sample space. Now, it does have to be part of a sample space. We, we don't consider uh, outcomes that are outside the sample space. We only work with outcomes that are within. Um, <clears throat> so that's something just sort of mentioned. Now, when we talk about uh, probability, one thing we're going to consider is this. It's equally likely. And I'm going to use the book's terminology. The chance for any outcome to occur is the same. for the other outcomes. <clears throat> so, in this case, um, you can sort of think of it as that the result in any experiment is not going to be sort of biased is what we're talking about. Um, for example, when you're flipping a coin, uh, the chance of getting a heads or a tail should be the same. Um, there's nothing biasing, per se, two tails versus two heads. Like, for some reason, you get two tails more likely than you would two heads. Um, things like that. So this is what we're going to be by equally likely. Now, this could get a little confusing. For example, if you have marbles mixed together in a bowl, one of the very classic um, examples and probabilities, you have red marbles, blue marbles, you put them in a bowl, what's the probability of getting a red or getting a blue? And oftentimes there's a different numbers of red from blue. And um, you'd say, well, wait a minute, let's say there's more blue marbles than red. Isn't it more likely that I'll get a blue marble instead of a red marble? And it's like, well, yes, that, that is true. But I think what they're talking about here is there's nothing biased beyond the number of blue versus red marbles. In other words, there's nothing like with the size of the marbles that would, like these were sort of bigger marbles that were painted blue that you would pick and that somehow biased them in some other way. So the idea is that all the marbles would be the same size and the same weight. And so no one marble is biased or more likely than the other marbles. And they'll just happen to be red or blue. 
uh, and that's it. Um, the, the color is just sort of a coincidence. Uh, but if you had like big blue marbles and these little tiny red marbles, you'll be probably picking the blue ones more often than the red. And that has something to do with some sort of bias that's in here. So we're going to deal with that. The likelihood of picking any marble, is e all the marbles would be equally likely to pick. And just so happens they might be more blue ones than red ones. But that's not actually influencing, like magically drawing your hand towards a blue marble away from a red one for some reason. Some sort of bizarre magical power. And if not magical, it could just be because the blue marbles are bigger and the red marbles are smaller and they're easy to pick up the blue ones. So in that example, all the marbles would be equally likely to be picked. And then you just see how many turned out to be blue and how many turned out to be red. So we're kind of avoiding those kinds of biases. Uh, in the case of a coin, you wouldn't have a coin that's, uh, uh, again, biased. It's weighted so the heads turns up more often than the tails, things like that. So the idea of equally likely outcomes is the chance of a, uh, getting a heads or a tail to be the same. Um, there's nothing that's going to bias you to picking a red or a blue marble, like size or some sort of magical thing going on, um, that, that kind of business. So anyway, moving on. So a little bit, we're not gonna quite go that far, but let's consider this. With these sort of non-biased, equally likely outcomes, we have a probability for an event. We have the definition. So it's the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So this is going to be why we're going to get a number between 0 and 1. Remember, we're only, for constructing these events, we're only using outcomes in the sample space. So that means we can't get bigger than the sample space. So all of our events will be as big as the sample space or smaller. And so we're going to be dividing usually a smaller number by a bigger number, and that's going to give us a fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1. So let's do an example. So let's say we have our set here. So let's say we want to find the probability of getting a pair of tails. Well, we look at the number of elements in that event. This is our event, TT. Well, there's only one thing in the event. And then how many are in the sample space total? Well, there's four. And we do count this as being part of the sample space. So the probability, we can say, is 1, 4, or 0 0.25. Let's then double check. They're doing fractions here. So we can either way. So that's the probability of getting a pair of tails. Now let's say we're the probability of this. Well, 
getting at least one or more hands. Well, it's the number of elements in the event, or outcomes in the event, divided by the number of outcomes in the entire sample space. So in this case, it'll be three-fourths, or 0 0.75. So questions about that. All right. So let's say we're working with something like this. Let's take a look at dice. Rolling dice twice. Well, let's say we're going to ask this question. Let's see, find that example for you real quick. Find the probability. that the sum of the dice is five. So what do we do here? Now, remember, we're going to compare the size of the event that the sum of the dice is five to the sample space. So let's try to figure out how big is the sample space. Well, well, it's all two tosses of a dice. So we roll the dice once, we're going to get a number from 1 to 6. Roll it twice, we get a number from 1 to 6. So what we can do is this. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. These are the numbers that could come from the first dice. And this could be what comes from the second dice. Now, as you might recall, we ran into this sort of thing back in section 12.1. How do we count things? So this is what we would call a two-stage experiment. So the first stage is going to be the number of outcomes from the first dice. And the second stage will be the number of outcomes from the second dice. Now, one way of visualizing this is thinking of it in terms of pairs. There's a, say, so this is a bit of a review. So we could look at pairs, like one and one, one and two, one and three, and so on, until we get to, say, Six and four. Six and five. And six and six. And we can see right away, well, if you want to count all the possible pairs, well, we could just do six times six gives us 36. So this is how large our sample space would be. 
It's the number of possible pairs or outcomes we could get by rolling a dice twice. Now there's an easier way. If you recall, our counting principle is this first stage times second stage. So we have a multi-stage experiment. First stage is we're rolling a dice. Second stage, we're rolling that dice for a second time. So how many outcomes are in the first stage? Well, you could get numbers one through six. And in the second stage, you're rolling a dice that could give you numbers one through six. So that means the number of total outcomes is 36. So again, this is the counting principle from 12.1. So this makes doing things a lot easier. So some of these abstract ideas with counting and theory, they can help us save time. Okay, so now we've got the sample space. There's 36 items in the sample space. Now what about the event? Now, events, these can be a little tricky. And sometimes the easiest thing to do, um, you can use counting principles as well, but you could also try to come up with it by just modeling it sort of to say on paper. So let's take a look at the possible outcomes. So say you get a one and a four. Well, that'll add up to five. Remember, that's our event. Or we could get a four. And a one. Or we get a two and a three. Or a three and a two. Now, are there any other ways to get a five? Well, you can think of it like this, and this isn't maybe the best way to go about it, but if you roll a one, the only way you can get a five is if you get a four. If you roll a two, the only way you can get a five is if you get a three. But then if you roll a three, the only way you could get a five is if you then roll a two. If you roll a four, the only way you can get a five is then roll a one. And then if you get a five or a six, well, you're going to go over because the second dice, whatever it comes up with, say even just a humble one, that's going to put you over the top. So these are the four outcomes that give you a five. So you can do this. So we've got four. So the probability well, it's going to be the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the entire sample space, including the outcomes for the event itself. And then you could reduce this. So it comes out to about 1 over 9. Let me just double check here real quick. It should be, yeah, they're reduced again. So that would be your answer. Questions about that? 
the right. So that's one way of looking at probability. Now, the other thing that's going to come up here is what we call empirical probability. So empirical probability works like this. Well, first, let me separate it from theoretical. When we're dealing with theoretical probability, we are able to come up with the entire sample space and the event that we're looking for. In other words, we can find out all the outcomes in the sample space and all the outcomes in the event. So we can use that. Struck the entire sample space of the entire event to compute the probability so basically what we just did so we've been working with empirical probability. We know what the outcomes are for flipping a coin. We know what the outcomes are for rolling a dice. Where things get dicey, no pun intended, is when we're dealing with something where we actually don't know all the outcomes. Um, this is stuff that you could probably come up with examples of this in real life. Um, say the probability of getting a flat tire. So if you haven't been driving for too long, you can kind of say, well, I don't know. I mean, how, how do you do this? Like, what's the probability of getting a year or some year where you get a flat tire versus years that you don't? Let's say we're doing something like that. So you count the number of years you've driven and there hasn't been a flat tire in any of those years. And then eventually, say the fourth year you've been driving, um, you finally get a flat tire. So of the four years of been driving, that would be your, your sample space would now be a size of four. One of those years got a flat tire. So the event would be a size of one. So it's one over four so far, or 25%. But let's say you'd go for another two years without getting a flat tire. So you drove for the first four, then you go two more. Well, now you have six years. So let me illustrate this. We don't know how to figure out exactly this flat tire thing. So years, so I'll say year one, you're okay, no flat tire. Year two, you're okay, no flat tire. So right now, if you look at the probability of getting a flat tire, well, it's going to be zero out of one, zero. Year two, no flat tires. So you have two years, no flat tires on any of these. So zero in the event, two in the sample space, we're still at zero. Year three, doing good. No flat tires, so the event has zero, sample space has three, we have zero. Year four, though. Uh, flat tire, yeah. pull over, change it. So we got one out of four, or say 0 0.25. Uh, year five, no flat tire. Okay, so now it's 
one out of five years or 0 0.2. Doing good. But then year six, uh, gotta go take care of that flat, pull over, take care of it. Now you're at two out of six years, which is one third or about 0 0.33. So the point is this, with empirical probability, we don't know exactly the sample space. It could be changing on us over time. We don't know the size of the event either. But as time passes, we can compute the probability of getting a year where we get a flat tire. And first three years, it's zero. Like flat tires just don't happen. That's just something people make up. Okay, okay. 25% of the time you could get a flat tire in your driving career. No, it's actually 20%. It's not even that much. Oh, wait a minute. It's actually a lot higher. It's 33%. So with empirical probability, we're sort of calculating things as the data comes in. So for this one, we calculate the probability as data comes in. So that's the idea. And so when we calculate the probability, of the event. Let's see. It's the number. Let's see. Of times event is observed. Divided by the number of observations. Or experiments. So it's the number of times the event is observed, say, that in a given year you got a flat tire, or maybe two or three, but that would be a flat tire year, versus the number of observations or experiments. Can you go through an entire year, you have to demark these years, say starting January 1st, um, can you go through that entire year without getting a flat tire? How many times have we attempted that, and whether we get a flat tire or not? So that's the idea of this. So you're gonna gather this information as it comes in. Now, there is an application of all this. So any questions about that? Any questions about how to calculate theoretical probabilities or observational or empirical probabilities? All right. So, <clears throat> There's an application for genetics here. And it's something called the Punnett square. Now to explain what a Punnett square is, and you've probably encountered these in biology class, but the idea is that you, your genes, the information that your cells use to build proteins that are ultimately used to build you, um, well, this is all stored in things called chromosomes. So what you have is you have 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 chromosomes in all. 
Now, the way these works is half of them, half of these 46, come from one parent, and then half come from some other biological parent. So I can give you a picture of what's going on here. Now this is sort of an oversimplified version of things. There are variations. But let's say we have So what typically happens, and it doesn't always happen, but what the machinery usually starts with is this kind of a procedure. Do this. So this would be a pair of chromosomes. So the typically cells do things like this. It doesn't always happen. There's variations on this. but. Um, this is sort of a common way they do things. And so bioparent A, bioparent B, and then there you go, you, you put things together. So what's happening is on a chromosome pair, you can have two copies of the same gene. So let's say a copy there and then copy over here. And the way they model this for the Punnett square is they'll say this came from one bio parent, this copy of the same gene, gene that sort of does the same thing like eye color or something like that. This would be a gene from the other bio parent. So which copy do we use? That's going to be the question. Now, there's a term for these copies, and they're called alleles. So 
So that's what that term refers to. And to determine which one's going to be used from bio parent A or bio parent B, I mean, there's definitely a conflict here. So what tends to happen is there's some sort of an idea that we might call dominance. And that for some reason, this copy will be used by your cells as opposed to this copy. Now, the way cells do things with DNA, they um, basically construct a copy of a gene. And that copy is called RNA. And the RNA leaves the nucleus of the cell. And then, let's see, where does it go? It goes into a structure. I'm going to be careful. I don't want to get this wrong. So it goes into a cellular structure that can read the RNA and then oftentimes produce a protein. So they're one of the building blocks of life. You have a genomic code. There's a genomic library. But there's also a protein library, I think, called a proteinome or something like that. All the different kinds of proteins that are, can be produced by cells. And um, these proteins, the, uh, the codes for building these proteins, these are you can find these on your DNA. And, um, well, if we've got two copies of the same gene, we have some alleles here, well, which copy do we use? So for reasons that are sort of beyond the scope of a mathematician, um, for some reason, one will be chosen over the other. We're going to call that dominance. And this is called a dominant allele. So what this means is that when there is a dominant one and the other one, which we call is recessive, That means whenever a dominant one is present, for whatever reason, it's going to be used as the code to do what the cell wants to do, and it's going to, the cell's going to ignore the recessive. But if there are two recessives, well, then the cell has no choice but to use those uh, recessive, uh, the recessive trait. So that means it'll get used. So basically, recessive traits um, and the and this is what's called a phenotype. This is when you can physically see um, the results of a dominant allele or two recessive alleles being used to produce something in the body. It could be hair color, it could be eye color, things like this. Um, you will only get the recessive phenotype if you would have two recessive alleles in your chromosomes. Because if there's the presence of a dominant, for whatever reason, it's going to be expressed and every excessive copy will be ignored. So you have to get a uh, chromosome pairs that don't have the dominant. So the way a Punnett square is this. And this is going to be a Punnett square. Let's see how they word it here. Um, it's usually for... Hmm. You use it often to find, try to figure out what traits going to be expressed by the cells. All right. So it's going to work like this. Let's say we have some elite. We have alleles for a gene. 
And that means we have copies for the same gene. And let's say it's just two copies, that's it. We can have a dominant or a recessive version. Um, and we'll get into some details here. So this will be dominant. This will be recessive. So what we can do with Punnett squares is we're going to say this. We can get various outcomes. So it's sort of like flipping the coin. You could get a uh, dominant for one parent, bioparent, or say the recessive for the other. You could have a dominant for one bioparent or recessive. So for example, Let's say bio parent one as alleles D and R and bio parent two as alleles R R. Now, here's the thing. We, when we do these exercises, we don't pretend to know exactly which allele, is it the dominant or the recessive, that the bio parent's going to give to the offspring. That part's going to remain a mystery. That we don't know. So we're going to guess. So this is something that we're not going to try to work out with our Punnett square. You're going to leave this part to be mysterious. What mechanism might choose a dominant trait versus a recessive trait to be passed on? That we don't know. We're going to look at this from a point of view of sample spaces instead. So we're going to treat this like they are equally likely probabilities. There's no reason for a dominant to be passed on more so than a recessive. So Basically, what we have is this. What's going to come out? We have no idea. So, What we're going to do is try to come up with a sample space assuming equally likely or equal likelihoods. So again, it's the same idea that you know we don't have a biased coin or a biased die. So the way we set this up is we have bio parent one. Their traits are a dominant and a recessive copy of this gene, of a dominant and a recessive. So that means a bio parent one. We can say BP1 and BP2. In BP1, this is the trait that's going to be expressed, the dominant copy of this gene. So that and the recessive won't be. But in bioparent two, since there are two recessive copies, it's only the recessive copy that's available. So this parent will express the recessive copy or the recessive trait. Um, 
So the way we're going to set this up, there's file pair one, file parent two, which is recessive, recessive. And so what we're going to do is sort of like with the dies. We have one through six, one through six. So we construct a sample space. And so this is going to be our sample space. Okay, let me make it a little. No, that's good. We'll leave it. So again, assuming that inheriting an allele is not biased, what are the chances of getting the dominant trait or the recessive trait showing through? Well, for the dominant, the probability is 2 out of 4, or 1 half. And the event to get recessive well again that's two out of four or one half. So that's the idea of the Punnett square. We don't make any guesses or assumptions whether a dominant trait or a recessive trait when it's when the chromosomes from the, the bio parents. Uh, there, one half is contributed, the other half contributes the other. We have no idea what's the probability of getting a dominant half or recessive half. We, we assume it's all equally likely. But that being the case, we can say, well, this is bioparent one and bioparent two. We can construct a sample space to see how many outcomes does the dominant trait show up in. And whenever the dominant trait shows up, that means that trait's going to be expressed versus how many times the recessive trait is going to appear. And that's when you have the recessive showing up in both, from both parents. So, all right. So let me do an example. Let's see, let me pick this. So let's say we're talking plants. We have one parent plant with red flowers as a genotype of RR. And then we have um, the other is white flowers with genotype RR. So red going to be dominant. White, recessive. So we want to compute the probability the offspring have white flowers. So to get white flowers, because it's recessive, the offspring has to have little r and little r. So let's do our Punnett square. So this is the red flower plant. 
it has two copies of this gene, but they're both the same copy. It's dominant red, dominant red. For the white flower plant, it also has two copies of this gene, a couple of alleles, but they're both recessive copies. Little r, r. So if we take a look, R, 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 R. So we want to find the probability that the offspring is going to have white flowers. Now, this is where some of the, the biology knowledge comes in. Because red is dominant, the presence of R always results in red flowers. So whenever there's a tug of war between capital R and little r, capital R always wins for some reason. We're not sure why. So that means there can't be a capital R present if you want to avoid red flowers. So only RR, where there are no capital R's, that's when you get the white flowers. So, do we have any double little r's? Well, we don't. There aren't any. So this means if you take a red flower that has two copies of the dominant allele, and you cross it with a plant with a white flower that has two recessives, then you are going to get a red flower. There is no way you'll get a white flower. So the probability will be zero out of four or zero. So questions about that. All right. So the last thing to talk about tonight <clears throat> And just for the sake of time, I'll probably just run through the formulas. It's the concept of odds. So Talk about a favorable event. And they describe this or sort a of favorable outcome. Is it satisfying? Let me use the words they're using. Favorable outcome. It satisfies some event or it's part of the event that we're looking for. And they contrast that with um, an unfavorable, uh, unfavorable event. <clears throat> so oftentimes, say like if you're shooting free throws or something like this, and a favorable event usually is making the free throw, and then the unfavorable event is missing the free throw. 
So that's the difference between favorable and unfavorable. Favorable is an observation you're looking for that you want to see happen. And unfavorable is something that occurs that you didn't want to occur, like missing that shot. So <clears throat> let's talk about odds. <clears throat> So, so let's say favorable odds so this is the number of number of favorable outcomes <clears throat> divided by the number of the unfavorable outcomes. So basically to give an example, well here let me do odds, favorable odds and odds against. What we do is we just flip them. So we're just going to flip these is what we're going to do. So number of favorable outcomes, number of unfavorable outcomes versus number of unfavorable outcomes, number of favorable outcomes. So let me give you an example to sort of illustrate. So let's talk about free throws. So you're going to shoot 10 free throws. You're going to make seven and miss three. So let's say we're going to try to come up with some odds. Let's just say this is one game. So based on this one game, what can we guess about the odds of you making free throws and missing them in the next game? Well, so odds in favor. So we're interested in making free throws. That's what we want to see you do. So it would be seven that you made and three that you missed. Odds against. We could say three, seven. Let's flip it. So again, we're using what we saw in the first game to try to come up with some odds for the second game. So we're going to say it's probably seven to three that you're, you know, in favor of you, you know, getting your seven shots or your performance in three throws. Now, there is a relationship between odds and probability. And so it's going to work like this. So first off, so you have the odds 
in favor are A over B. So note, the sample space has the size A plus B. So the way we know that is that if we look at an experiment, there are outcomes we want to see, and then there's the outcomes we didn't want to see. And if we add all those together, that's the total of the outcomes for the sample space. So this means the probability, let me see here, now let's let A is the number of favorable outcomes. So this means the probability of the favorable event Well, it's the number of outcomes in that event, which is A, divided by the number of outcomes in the sample space. So it's A over A plus B. So if we're given odds like this, odds in favor, then the probability of the favorable event, not favorable event occurring is going to be this. Now there's one more formula. formula. Let's see here. So let P of E be the probability of favorable event E. So again, we're going to let A be the number of favorable outcomes in E. And then we're going to let B is the number of unfavorable outcomes and then A plus B is the number of outcomes in the sample space. Now this is just our setup. Oh, sorry, we're going over time. I'll try to wrap it up quickly. So number of favorable events, number of unfavorable outcomes, or outcomes, outcomes, number of outcomes in the total sample space. So what we're going to do is this. If we take the odds of a favorable event, what we can do, oh, so let me make an observation. If P of E is the probability of event E, and this is the favorable, then 
then it turns out that 1 minus P of E, this is the probability of an event that's unfavorable. For the sake of time, I can't go into exactly why this is the case. Other than when you take the probabilities of events, um, they're going to add up to one is what's going to happen, assuming the events don't overlap. So for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that for now. I'm going to come back to that because we're already over time. I want to get through this so you have it for the vacation. Um, so if we take the odds A over B, we can divide top and bottom by A plus B. There might be a way of doing this without having to use that principle. So this right here is the probability of the event being favorable. Now, what we could try to do with this, let's see. That going to work. We can add A and subtract an A. This, I know, seems kind of crazy, but it's sort of a math trick. Sort of an algebra trick here. So without having to use that principle of all the non-overlapping non probabilities adding to one, we're going to do this algebra trick instead. I think it's even trickier. I'm going to do this. Now, usually what I would do is I would divide each of these by this denominator. I'm going to do it like this, sort of partially do it, because I could still divide this one and this one. I could still break it up, but I'm not going to because this is going to lend itself to what we want. This is again the probability of E. And A plus B over A plus B. So without having to use that principle that I don't have time to explain, I'm going to get this sort of wacky formula. So the formula is this. The odds, the favorable odds, are equal to the probability of the favorable odds of outcome occurring minus the probability as the denominator. So let me do one example, and that's going to be it. I know we're out of time. We're way over time. So let's say we have this. In 2010, the racehorse Russell Meyer won the Belmont Stakes, beating the favorite Icebox. The odds against Russell Meyer winning the race were 12 to 1. What was the probability of Russell Meyer winning the race? So let's take a look here. So odds against. Russell Meyer. So odds against are 12 to 1. So what that's going to mean is the so the probability 
in favor is the number we have in favor and then favor plus unfavorable. Now these are the odds against. So that means this is our B. That's going to be our A. So we'll get 1 over 1 plus 12. And so the probability will be 1 13. So not a very good probability there for Drosselmeyer. So any questions about that? And just emphasize this, these are the odds against. So you have to, your B is going to be on top, your A is going to be on bottom. All right, so that's it for tonight. Uh, if you have any questions about this, let me know. Um, uh, I'll be checking messages over the weekend. And um, other than that, good night, good luck, and good luck on the tabs. Bye, sir. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too, Justin. Thank you. Have a good Thanksgiving.